social disability. And I came across this one, and it just so spoke to my heart. I had already given Lori the songs for this week, and um, everything has changed. And I felt led to share this this morning. And um, today is your best day because of the blood of Jesus. And it's taken from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 19. It says, You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. How greatly blessed, honored, and favored you are today because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Without his precious blood, your day would be covered in darkness, hopelessness, and despair. Instead, your day is flooded with light, filled with hope, and enriched with every spiritual blessing. The blood of Jesus has taken you from the dungeons of slavery and brought you to the highway of holiness. It has delivered you from the cruelty of a harsh taskmaster and brought you into the tender care of a loving father. It has saved you from a life that was a descending stairway of bondage into an ascending life of freedom that lifts you from glory to glory. Now, this is what the blood of Jesus does for you. The blood of Jesus cleanses you from the stain of sin, looses you from the chains of sin, frees you from the power of sin, saves you from the judgment of sin, and heals you from the pain of sin. The blood of Jesus restores and reconciles you to God. The blood of Jesus not only makes it possible for you to be forgiven, but it also makes it possible for you to be fully cleansed. Why is today your best day? It is your best day because the blood of Jesus has not lost its power. And it will never lose its power. To make it possible for you to begin this day forgiven, to be clothed in garments of righteousness, and to face the day with clean hands and a pure heart. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. Amen. So I've asked Mark and Deborah if they would open us up with this song.
pay your bill off and you get back that piece of paper that's paid in full. Woo! Don't Ooh. make you yeah. feel real good. Yeah. Your sin debt has been paid in full. Man, by the blood of Jesus. And I think sometimes we just get so focused on this world and what's going on around here. And we forget that it's the precious blood of Jesus when you're set free from oh, sin. And we are pure, we are cleansed, we are holy, we are a child of God. Y'all need to claim that today, okay? Quit yeah. walking around like you're so sad and claim the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood, so let's stand and sing that this morning. <coughs>
God's house today. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, nothing but the blood. The theme is on the blood this morning. That ties right into our message. When you appreciate the blood, you recognize it is by God's grace. Because he didn't have to do it. He didn't know us a thing. But he gave his blood. That we might have forgiveness for our sin. It's just good to be here in good seats and everyone else. Don't forget tonight, 6 o'clock, prayer time for our church, for the country. Uh, and we'll have this one and one on the fourth, uh, fourth Sunday night. Uh, we had one yesterday. Appreciate all those who came out and supported that. Uh, if you're missing a treat, if you missed those prayer meetings, and yesterday was very, the Holy Spirit really moved in that prayer meeting as we prayed for the country. And I also want to say thank you to all those who came out and supported the revival this week. God moved in a mighty way, and we just had a tremendous time in the Lord over at uh, Steve Barham's New York Christian Church. Amen. And uh, thank the Lord for that. So appreciate all those who came out and supported that. Um, Pray for Cindy. She's back there. Her blood pressure is going up and down. So um, we're monitoring it right now. I've got it to like 195, but it's back down to 146 now. So um, but we're trying to monitor it a little bit. So let's keep praying in prayer. All right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessing, the privilege that we have to be in your house this morning and to worship you, to open your word and to hear from you. Thank you, Lord, for that precious blood, that life-giving blood that was shed on Calvary for forgiveness of our sins. Lord, help us to never take that for granted. It was the ultimate price, and you paid it because you loved us. Now, Father, I pray you would sin. Bless her, Lord, as she's battling this blood pressure, get her down in touch with you. Lord, be with every part of this service this morning that it may glorify your precious and holy name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 There I was on death row, guilty in the first degree. Son of God, hang on to hell. Hell was my destiny. The crowd was shouting, crucified. Could have come from these lips of mine. Shame was killing me. It would take a miracle to wash me clean. Then I read the red.
think the screen. There's a lost and found ring. See the sound room. But they don't know how to make the sound. You know? they, got, they got nothing to sound room. If you lost that ring, I'd like to have your shirt. I think Ashley found it. Where'd you find that, Ashley? It was uh, out there in the parking lot. Just in the parking lot. Okay. So found that ring. I mean, if you missed that ring, you didn't go get it. If you found it, put it back. <laughs> Don't forget to vote November the 3rd. Now, I want to remind you again, prayer meeting tonight. Prayer meeting tonight. Uh, Republicans vote November the 3rd, Democrats November the 4th. No, no. <laughs> Not really. Um, go back to the other slide for a minute. The latest thing. I need to tell, tell them about that so they can plan for it. This is October the 31st, 10 o'clock. During one of our prayer sessions that uh, Teresa shared about one of Naomi's friends, Megan, and so we decided that we would have um, prayer um, brunch, ladies' prayer brunch, at my house on October 31st at 10 o'clock. Um, and if you would, just bring your favorite breakfast dish, whatever it might be, and I'll provide coffee if you have something else you can see. <laughs> I'll provide coffee. <laughs> but uh, I, I really ask that you invite friends to come with you to this. I think you will be very encouraged. Megan has an awesome testimony, and you're not going to want to miss that. So it's at my house, and uh, I would love to not see you. Not at my house. That's right. It's at my house. <laughs> and uh, I'd love to see each and every lady there. You can come. But if you have any questions, just let me know. There wouldn't be enough room in the doghouse for <laughs> so, while they're doing that, I need a place to have breakfast, man. <laughs> what? Men's prayer breakfast. Men's prayer breakfast. Huh? Yeah, that's, that's, that, that, that's right. That is. That, that's the day we have the men's prayer meeting. So we'll be hearing those sisters. <laughs> okay? All right, don't forget that. I'm trying to think of any other than that. Yes? Uh, early voting starts Thursday. Thursday. Yes, early voting starts Thursday. I'll be there. There's a change up in Franklin County. The closest place is going to be the sheriff's substation. <coughs> sheriff's substation. There's Bun. Yeah. Okay. Sheriff's substation. Not the library. Okay, not the library anymore. Uh, sheriff's substation. Everybody know where that is? That's where old. Yeah. Um, yeah, the pharmacy used to be there. Okay. All right. Let's have all the kids, 11 and under. Let's receive the children's offer. We got fun this morning. Isn't that great? Good. Who wants to hold it? You want to hold it? You want to hold it? Alright, if you hold up the dollar bill of five, please be smiling. They're with me so good you got to smile. Father, thank you for these children. I pray God you help us teach them. That it is a blessing, an honor, a privilege, and a joy to give back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
up here, please? offering that we receive now, Lord, please multiply it. Bless it, Lord, and guide us in the way that we use it, that it may bring honor and glory to you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Blood of Jesus, <coughs> there is a fountain of
1 Peter chapter number 1, verse 22. And while you're turning, let me just say, pray for your church. Um, we're going to have to add some more security levels, measures. We um, had somebody kick a window in downstairs Friday night. And they decided not to come in. I think there was too much glass left in the window. They were afraid they'd crawl in that narrow window and cut themselves. And another didn't come in because nothing missing. And we never came over Saturday morning up up for the quilting ministry. The door was locked and the alarm was still activated. Which means you, if you get in here, you can get out through that door, but you can't lock it back without a key. So they didn't come in, I don't think. But Pierce Baptist Church was robbed Monday night. They got two speakers from them. Uh, Hopkins Chapel was robbed a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Steve Barron's church has been robbed. Uh, so. There's a bunch of vandalism going on right here, so we think they know it. They think it's a woman, any woman, kind of Volkswagen golf convertible. That ought not be too hard to find. It's not a convertible. But anyhow, I'm going to put some, uh, I can get four cameras for $89 to put in the classroom and do things like that. So I think we're going to make an investment in about eight cameras um, that will automatically activate if you. Um, have any motion. And you cut them on and off, so we don't have to run them all the time. We just run them when we're not here. So that would be a good thing to do. I think we're going to do that. But anyhow, just pray. Um, pray for all the churches, because there seems to be a rash out going around there, vandalizing a bunch of churches in this area. It's a sad thing when you have to... Our society has really got to be great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and, and church. One, one church, they stole, of all things, the communion plates. Oh, what? Communion plates. <laughs> Maybe they thought they were gold they could sell. They thought they were brass. <laughs> but, brass. You know how much a, a communion plate would weigh if it was brass? <laughs> uh, they have to be brass colored. <laughs> but that's what they stole. I mean, that's the only thing they got out of there was communion plates. They got the gift certificates and pierces. Yeah, they, 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 they got gift certificates and speakers from pierces. They had the gift certificates for the um, Baptist Children's Home. That, that we support. They had taken out some gift certificates, to gift cards and stuff to give to them, and they went in Mark's office. They went in the preacher's office and took them out of his out of his desk drawer. So, um, I'm glad y'all going around. So just pray. All right, we'll take as many precautions as we can. Uh, so it's a sad state when you get people get to. Or I can remember when the last place you would have robbed would have been a church. Well, I was, I was a mean little kid growing up, but, but I knew if I robbed a church, I would die. Start when my mom and dad found out they killed us. <laughs> Especially the church. We used to leave church door un- unlocked. So people could come in and pray all they wanted to. Do what? Yeah, the guy had something else there other than, other than the election infection. We get close to the end of it. We get close to the cure of the election infection. That would be November the 3rd. But. <laughs> All right, turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter. I want to continue our study of 1 Peter. Today we want to talk about love and longing in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 23. And the, the whole idea behind this message is God's plan for our transformation, our change, begins and ends with love. First you taste God's love, that makes you crave God's word, and then you begin to love God's people. And that's the, that's the outline, that's where we're going to look at it. But, um, how many of you ever saw, I, I don't watch animated films, not that much. Now, I, I like pets and all them, pets and pets too and that kind of stuff, but I'm not a big animated film fan. Now, my son is 40, how old is Brian now, 42? He gets up every Saturday morning and watches cartoons still. So. <laughs> <laughs> I like cartoons. I like cartoons. I like cartoons. But there is a story, there is a movie that got a story that I wanted to share with you. I found a clip. Uh, I haven't seen the whole movie, but I have watched the clip. How many of you remember Kung Fu Panda? Okay, Kung Fu Panda. Uh, and if I don't pronounce their names right, you help me out. Uh, it's out of shape, Panda Bear. Uh, po, is that his name, Po? And he longs to learn that, how to be a Kung Fu fighter. And he's selected by the village leaders to be the Dragon Warrior, the greatest Kung Fu, Kung Fu fighter of all time. But in spite of his statues, Po is still a big, fat klutz. And the master who's charged with transforming this panda bear into a fighting machine, uh, <laughs> he becomes a little frustrated with it. And then they learn that the most fearsome villain in all of China, um, Tai Lung, the favorite, he, he's, he's notorious 
He's escaped prison and he's coming to destroy the new dragon warrior, which just now happens to be Poe. Poe, what is Poe? So take a look at what happens when Poe tries to sneak away. He's tired of training and he knows this guy's trying to go try and come and, and do him in. So he's trying to sneak away. Watch what happens. It's his. Where are you going? You ever feel like that you need to be changed into something that you're not? I mean, you look at yourself and you realize, just think about it for a minute. As believers in Christ, we've been given a status we don't deserve. We are children of a holy, righteous, just God. With an indestructible inheritance that we have from heaven. And we're called to be holy in everything that we do. As he was trying to become a kung fu fighter, we're trying to live holy for the Lord Jesus Christ. But how are we successful in doing it? How successful are we in doing it? And do you ever feel like, what's going to transform me? What's going to change me into what I need to be? <coughs> and I'll tell you, only Jesus Christ can do that. No kung fu master or anybody else will ever be able to do it. But Jesus Christ can. God himself purchased our freedom from a wasted life with the precious blood of his own son. And he gave us a status that we don't deserve. But we struggle, struggle with our old flabby spiritual nature trying to live up to it. We're trying to live up to it. Just like Pat Poole was trying to live up to his new call. But who's going to change it? You have to let the Lord Jesus Christ do it. He's the only one that can. If you have any Bibles, turn, if you have Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Stand, if you will, for the reading of God's Word. Reading from the New King James. Peter says, Since you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brother, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is His grace. And all the glory of God is the flower of the grass. And the grass withers and the flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted the Lord is gracious. 
Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this day. Thank you, Lord, for what's been done here already this morning. I pray now you open our hearts and minds. And help us to see, Lord, there has to be a loving and a longing in our hearts for you. And then, Lord, you will transform us. You will make us. You will guide us. You will bring us to that place where we glorify and honor you. Knowing, Lord, we'll never reach perfection this side of heaven. But we will grow daily closer to you if we long and we love. Have your way away if there's any listening by way of internet or even here in the sanctuary, Lord, that do not know you as Savior. And I pray today they come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Have your will and way. Help me, Lord. Let me get out of the way. And may the Holy Spirit preach this message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to start off by saying our spiritual transformation, our change, our recreation, if you will, our new birth begins with the love of Jesus Christ. It begins when we taste, first taste God's love. That's point number one. It begins when we experience the goodness of God. Literally, when we taste that God is kind or pleasant, when we realize that he loved us so much that he willingly died for us, and it, it's his almighty grace that makes it possible for us to come to know him, then we begin to recognize and taste his love. I'm going to kind of work my way backwards in this text because the author assumes that his readers have already tasted the goodness of God. He assumes they're saved, born again, child of God, and they've already tasted that, so he tells them how to grow closer to the Lord. So, with that in mind, Matthew 11 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden, he says, is light. You see, Jesus invites us to come to him where we find that the life he gives us to live, I want to say this now, listen to me, is really an easy life. We make it difficult. We make it difficult by disobedience. But what he gives us, in other words, it fits so well um, that it's pleasant to wear this life. Unlike the demands of other religious leaders, other religions ask you to do this and do this and do this and do this. On the other hand, Jesus Christ comes alongside and bears the weight with us. Okay? Now, I know that there are a lot of churches that put a whole lot of regulations on you, but I want to tell you something. Some of those regulations may be man-made. May be man -made. God has standards. Yes, he does. But man adds a whole lot to those standards sometimes. Serving the Lord should not be burdensome because we love Him. And if we obey Him, it will not be a burden. It's when we disobey and we get off on our own and decide we want to go on our own route and do our own thing and act like we want to instead of how He wants us to. That's when, we, that's when the burden comes in. You know when the burden comes in? is when you disobey God and you recognize it's sin and the Holy Spirit grieves you. That's the burden. That's the burden. Jesus said, my burden is light. If you've ever experienced the kindness of Christ, if you haven't experienced it, I want to say, let me say this, if you you've never asked him to come into your heart in the day, I want you to come to him today and get that taste. Taste the Lord is good, he's kind, and he's ever present with us. Romans 2, 4 says, not, know, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. It is God's, if you repent of your sins and ask Jesus Christ to say that it was God's goodness that led you to that point, it certainly wasn't my goodness or your goodness. But we're all sinners. In 2002, 2001, and I don't want to pronounce this man's name right, it's Tim Goglin, I guess he was the White House Office of Public Liaison. Uh, and they gave him daily access to President George Bush for seven years. And then it all ended on February 29th, 2008, when a well-known blogger revealed that 27 of the 39 articles this guy had written had been plagiarized. And by the mid-afternoon the next day, he was, his career in the White House was over. He was summoned. He admitted his guilt, and he said it began a personal crisis that affected him and his family immensely. Humiliation on his wife, his family, his closest friends, and finally the President of the United States. So he was summoned to the White House to face President Bush. And once inside the office, Oval Office, he shut the door, and he said, Mr. President, I owe you. And President Bush said, he looked at him and said, Tim, you're forgiven. He said, but sir, the President interrupted him again and said, stop. I have known grace and mercy in my life, and you are forgiven. Listen to me. After a long talk, the healing process was launched for him. Included repentance, reflection, spiritual growth, and he said, and I'm quoting him, political power can lead to pride. That was my sin, 100% pride. By offering and receiving forgiveness, but offering and receiving forgiveness is a different kind of strength. That's the kind of strength I want to develop now. And he wrote that in Wins and Losses, World Magazine. That's his quote. 
He learned. He experienced grace and mercy. It changed his life. When you experience the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, it will change your life. When you experience when you experience the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, you will show grace and mercy and forgiveness to other people around you. Amen. You have trouble giving for showing grace and mercy and forgiveness, it's probably because you really haven't experienced it from God's Amen. standpoint. Amen. I'm just telling it like it is. Amen? Amen? All I know how to do. Listen. A taste of Psalm 34 8 says, Taste the Lord. Taste and see that the Lord is good. But I want you to understand, taste is not quite enough, is it? But how could someone who's tasted the graciousness and the mercy and the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and really experienced it, it's like nibbling off the plate makes you want to consume the whole platter. You want more. Yeah? And that leads to the second step in our spiritual transformation. That's growth. After you taste God's <coughs> grace, experience that after you taste his love, you begin to crave God's word. Now listen to me. This is going to get deep right here. It's going to sound shallow, but it's really deep. If you apply it to your life. You crave God's word. We long for the pure spiritual milk of God's word, and then we deeply desire to get as much of the Bible as we can. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow. Or better, to grow to a better translation, to grow toward your salvation. Now, you're already saved through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but to realize its full potential, you got to crave that spirit, pure spiritual milk. you got to have a ravenous appetite for the Word of God. So much so that you cannot do without it. Now, I want you to think about it. Now, listen to me. Is there a desire in your heart for God's Word? So that when you get up in the day, you cannot spend the day without some time in God's Word, feasting on His Word. Amen. If there's not, something's wrong, my friend. Yeah. Something's wrong. You ever see a newborn baby <laughs> that wants his mother's milk? That little baby cries and wails and flails, and nobody, nobody can get any rest until he or she gets a drink. And that baby sucks and sucks and sucks like its life depends upon it, because the fact of the matter is it does. It's not going to grow and thrive unless it gets that milk that it needs to live. You're not going to grow and survive as a Christian. Now, you're saved, but you're not going to grow unless you get that milk of that word. It's the spiritual realm. You're going to, have, you're going to thrive and grow spiritually. Then you need the spiritual nourishment. We need to crave that pure, unadulterated milk of the word and get into it. That's what I see in a lot of you Christians. And it's amazing how the devil thwarts our appetite. When a person, person first gets saved in the faith and they get a taste of his grace, they can't get enough of the Bible. I mean, I, I'm the same way. I'm just like y'all. When I first got saved, man, I, I went out and I bought me a Thompson scope. Food. Well, uh, let me say, put it this way. When I came back to the Lord and really dedicated my life to him, I went out and bought me a Thompson chain record Bible. And if you look at that thing now, you can't hardly read the pages. I've got so many writings and marks in them. I went through Liberty Home Bible Institute, writing everything I could in the pages of that Bible. Uh, and I still got it downstairs. As a matter of fact, when I have question and answer periods, that's when I bring it up because I got all my notes in it. Um, I couldn't get enough of it. Young people, when they get saved, they want the Word of God. That's why I put a Bible in their hands if you can. Because I, want them to, I know they're, going, they're hungry after it. They're going to hunger after it. They're going to thirst. But it won't be long before, after a while, the devil begins to rob you of that appetite. And what happens is, he starts to feed you with things that you don't need and don't want. And it takes away your appetite for the Word of God. Now, hang on, I'm going somewhere in this one a little bit. You get hungry for something else, it takes away your appetite for the Word of God. I mean, how many of I, I love Mexican restaurants. I mean, I do. But they go out here, when you get there, they give you that big old bowl of, a bowl of saucer and a bowl of chips. And I've ordered a steak fajita. Okay? And I know it's coming. And it's steak and vegetables. All kinds of good stuff. Mm. I sit there and fill up on that cheese and on that nacho and sauce. And when it gets there, I've lost my appetite for the steak. That's what, that's what I'm telling you. That's what happens. The devil feeds you things in your life that takes away your thirst and your hunger for the word of Almighty God. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I just have to push it. They only did that the other day. We just pushed him chips aside. Say, hey, you pushed him towards me. <laughs> 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 I pushed him towards David. 
Uh, yeah, you're interested. Y'all know what they might have to take the heat of coming, whatever it was. But anyhow, Pat Summerall. And that cheese sauce, when George got to have queso, wow. <laughs> you got to have a bottle or a bowl of queso. Yeah. And it, man, I'm making myself hungry. <laughs> Do I? Have you done yet? Pat Summerall, how many of you remember him? Well known sports announcer. He trusted Christ for his life and became alcohol back in the late 1960s. And he described his life as Christ. He said, it's, He said, My life with Christ is like an alcoholic looking for a drink. If he wants it bad enough, he can find it no matter what. I'm like that when I come to finding prayer services and Bible study. No matter, no matter where I'm working, I know that they're out there and I can find them. So he, he compared his thirst for the Word of God now to his thirst for what he had for alcohol. That's what I'm saying. The devil replaces your thirst for the Word of God with other things. Other things, other activities. Yeah. Some of them may be fine. You know, nothing wrong with playing golf unless it takes away from you finding the Word of God. Amen? Nothing wrong with watching television in some way. It'll take away from the word, got time with the Word of God. Some things are okay, but they're, they're, they replace. They give you appetite. I'll give you another example here in a minute. Uh, I want to ask you something. Do you find you have that kind of craving for God's Word today? If you want to grow, you have to have a ravenous appetite for spiritual things. If you want God to transform you into something useful, then you've got to have a hunger for the Word of God. The problem is, too many believers don't seem to have that appetite. They're content to come in and listen to two or three sermons a month, but they're not really hungry for spiritual things. They never get fed. That's why we're going to run that inductive Bible study through video that we talked by Howard Hendricks beginning on Wednesday nights in a few weeks. You don't see them in the Bible on a daily basis trying to get as much out of it as they can. As a result, they're weak spiritually and just kind of lackadaisical in their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they can come when they feel like it and can't come, don't come when they don't feel like it. I ain't talking about being sick. I'm talking about just having don't want to. Hello. A lot of people get sick, but the real problem is they don't want to. It's a don't want to itis. It's infectious. Some of you may say the passion is gone. The appetite for spiritual things is no longer there like it was. And they say, Pastor, that's me. How can I get my appetite back? Well, you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, lay aside all malice, all deceit, Hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. If we're going to get our appetite back to pure spiritual milk of God's Word, then we've got to get rid of the junk food that we're fed to put into our minds and our hearts. And put away those wrong attitudes that we have towards other people. The five things that are listed here are things that hinder a healthy relationship. You can't have a healthy relationship with God if in your heart there is malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking. Evil speaking is slander. Okay? Same thing. We call it gossip. I said, well, if it's true, it ain't gossip. Yeah, it is. You don't have to tell everything you know. Say, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> but don't we love to? No, we just love to. You got to put that junk food away. Here's another example. What I'm talking about the devil taking things and putting them in your life to take away your spiritual appetite. Several years ago, park rangers in the Grand Canyon National Park had to kill over two dozen mule deer because they got hooked on junk food. Junk food left behind by visitors to the park. Things like potato chips and cheese curls and candy and ho-hos and Twinkies and all that kind of stuff like that that you love to eat. Say amen. Once they got a taste of the sugar and salt, the deer, the deer developed a severe, extreme addiction to that kind of food, and they didn't want, they wanted to eat only junk food. And they wouldn't, as a result, they ignored the food they needed, leaving them in poor health and on the edge of starvation. The junk food cravings cause them to lose their natural ability to digest vegetation that they normally eat. One park ranger said he called this junk food the crack cocaine of the deer world. Crack cocaine of the deer world. So it's when we get our, we ingest thoughts of sometimes sweet revenge or or treachery, or a kind of sugarcoat hypocrisy. We like to take hypocrisy and sugarcoat it. <coughs> Sour envy and some kind of acidic, disastrous slander for somebody else. That diet keeps us from hungering for the things after God. When you see our relationships are not right, then our appetites are all wrong. You can't love God and hate people at the same time. I'll say this. I don't think you can... 
Love God and just like people. Yeah. I want to show you a minute what kind of God love, what kind of love God expects for us for other people. First John 1 4. Verse 20 says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not know, <clears throat> does not have love, does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? So if you want your craving back to the things of God, then you got to start putting away those things that are hindering healthy relationships in your life. Put away the attitudes and actions of the heart that keep you from getting close to God. And that leads us to the third and final step. You first taste God's love. Then you crave God's word. And finally, we love God's people deeply and sincerely. Amen. Now this is a tough one. This is, this is you have your transformation, your recreation, your growth in the Lord has reached a state where it's impossible for you to do this. Only God can do this for you. We make sacrificial commitments to care for one another. That's when you give yourselves fully to the benefit of our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1 22 says, Since you have purified your soul in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. That's no half hearted commitment here. That's an all out devotion to God's purpose. That word translated sincere was used of Christ when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane when he says he was praying. And it says that in being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. It's the same word there for, that you translated sincerely. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And the word literally means to be stretched out, to be at full stretch, and have the idea of being a, 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 in an all-out manner, an intense strain. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of love that he's talking about, an intense, straining love to reach out to everybody around you. That's how we love one another. God calls us to love one another at full stretch, in all out manner, in a tense strain, with everything we've got. That goes just beyond tolerating others. It goes beyond being polite and nice to each other. Mm -hmm. That kind of love goes out of his way to give of himself for another's benefit, even if that person doesn't deserve it. You say, Pastor, that's impossible. And I would agree with you. The kind of love we're talking about here is a supernatural, God-like love. That's why I say God you have to reach that point where God can only do it through you. But if you and I have been born again, we've been transformed by the word of God himself, then it is entirely, po listen to me, it is entirely possible for us to love like that. 1 Peter one twenty three says this, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever, because, listen, all flesh is of grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. It was preached to you. You believed it. It changed your life. It was not, listen, your life is not the result of some human tech talk that's going to disappear in a little while. Your new life is the result of God's talk. God's like, like, God like love at full stretch is what brought you into the family of God. All you have to do is obey. All you have to do is put into practice and you'll be able to live and love with that supernatural love. <clears throat> Again, verse 22, since you have purified your soul in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Notice again, the heart has to be right. Love one another fervently with a pure heart. Now, I, I apologize to this man ahead of time for mispronouncing his name, but I read in this article and uh, since he's foreign, I have trouble with foreign names. I know y'all don't, but I do. His Bible college professor, best I can pronounce is Johanna Cappadocia. And he, he, listen, he discovered the love of all the mind of God. What, I didn't pronounce it right? K-A-T-A-N-A-C-H-O. However it is. You did good. I did good, okay. Let me tell you about it. He passed it. His name is not that important, but what happened to him is he pastors a small church in Jerusalem. And he's Palestinian. Are you getting this picture now? Yeah. He's Palestinian in Jerusalem, pastoring a small church. And he faces a wide form of persecution on a daily basis. One of the most dangerous forms of that harassment comes from the Israeli soldiers who patrol the city. They're always on the lookout for potential terrorists. And you know where the terrorists come from from Israel? 
Pray with them. And he starts doing it. <coughs> now when they see him walking down the street and they don't know him, you talk about profiling, but they profile. <laughs> and they see him. And these soldiers routinely impose spontaneous curfews on Palestinians, and they even have the legal right to shoot a Palestinian if he or she does not respond quickly enough to their demands and their service. And here's a Palestinian pastor in Israel. Christ's Spirit on the Mount says to love your enemy, and that seemed impossible for this man to do. And I'm reading from him now. He said, that. He said yeah, there it was. It's unchanging. God told me to love these people. Quoting him, he said, for me, love was an active and countercultural decision because I was living in a culture that pervaded hatred of the other. And not only did the context promote hate, but the circumstances fed on a daily basis, the newspapers, television, media, neighbors, everything. One of the markers of the Israeli Jews and Palestinians able, able, Arabs is alienating the other. To break that marker, I must have some other world view. And he said, at first I tried to fail in my attempts to feel love for these Israeli soldiers that were stopping me and harassing me and persecuting me and even had the right to shoot me if I didn't do what they wanted to do. He said, I had trouble loving them with the love of God. He said, they randomly, they randomly checked for my identification card, time time stopping me for hours, feeding my fears and anger. He confessed his inability <coughs> until he realized something significant. He said, I realized the radical love of Christ, listen to this, is not an emotion, but a decision. Mm -hmm. yeah, a decision. He said, so I decided to show love however reluctantly by sharing the gospel message with the soldiers that stopped me on the street. And with this new resolution, he, revelation, resolution, he began to carry a copy of a flyer with him, written in Hebrew and English with quotations from Isaiah 53. <coughs> And the words, real love, printed across the top. He said, every time a soldier would stop him, he handed him both his ID card and the flyer. Because the quote came from Hebrew scripture, the soldier, being Israeli, would usually ask him about it before letting him go. And listen to this. He said, after several months of this, I suddenly noticed my feelings toward the soldiers had changed. Mm -hmm. He said, I was surprised to know it was a process, but I didn't pay attention to that process. My older feelings were no longer there anymore. Now I would pass in the same street, see the same soldiers as before, but now finding myself praying, Lord, let them stop me so I can share the love of Christ with them. Now that's a transformation. That's a transformation. But it didn't happen until he began to obey the word of God and apply it to his life. And all of a sudden, the people who harassed him had harassed him. He now felt sympathy for them and wanted to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Look, I, I want you to really take that lesson to heart because that's what we're talking about here. You say, I can't love my enemies in that manner. Jesus Christ made it through, you can. But you have to open yourself up to him. And let him do the transformation. You have to do what he asks you to do, whether you like it or not. And the change will take place. And when it happens, you say, How did that happen? Because there will be a change of attitude. It won't be all the night. It will be an aggressive man. But all of a sudden, you start feeling it. For those that you have to have, you have to feel big. And I'm closing. Man, we get you out early today. You can get to the Mexican restaurant early. Right, Donald? Let me ask you a closing. Do you want to be able to love sincerely from the heart of God as God wants you to? Then you simply start with <coughs> simple obedience. Decide to show love. Whether you feel it or not. And let God change your heart. Transformation takes place like this. We taste God's love, we crave God's word, and then we love God's people deep. You can't get it out of work. You gotta first you gotta first taste God's love when you do it. That should create in you a love for God's word. And the love for God's word should create in you a love for God's people. Head your bow, eyes are closed, no one looking around for this moment. Can I ask you to 
Jesus. How many of you can say, well, I've taken the first step. I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. The word of testimony, you have got your hands at this moment. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Now, especially, why do you ask that every service? Because I've been in this 38 years now. And I've seen people raise their hands time and time and time again. And then one day, the Holy Spirit says to them, wait a minute. Are you really sure? I don't see you come to the Lord. So I never fail to ask that question. As long as I have the opportunity. Because you never know. I can't remember the name of the priest. He's one of Joy's pastors. I think it's Billy Dix. I'm not sure. But anyhow, he, was, he served the Lord for years as a pastor. Before he got saved. Huh? Preacher Brad. Preacher Brad. For years before he got saved. You couldn't raise your hand, you're not sure this morning. If there's any doubt in your mind, you say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure this morning. Will you I'll wait a test for you. Just lift up your hand, put it right back down, and I'm not going to do that. I won't do that. I just want to pray for you. Anyone at all? Christian. Decide to show love today. You can make that decision today. You, as a child of God, if you're going to grow in grace towards the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to decide to show God's love, whether you feel like it or not. If you think God went to the cross because He loved us so much because of how good we were, now He decided to show love even when it wasn't deserved. And that's what He asked us to do today. Would you stand to your feet, Heavenly Father? Have your will away in this invitation. I pray God that your people, your people, your children, we decide today and say, God, I'm going to show you your love. Even when I don't feel it. And I want you to help me grow more. In Jesus' name. When they come, would you come today? Would you slip out and come? Lord, have your will away in this invitation. May your people be responsive to your spirit. In Jesus' name, I pray. Paul. No, no, don't wait, don't hesitate. Slip out of hell, make all the business. I'm going to show you love, Lord. Because that's what you asked me to do. Let God have his way in your life. All God's 